Okay, hello everyone to, uh, and welcome to the February edition of Haskellers. Um, today we have an academic collaboration for you. So let me introduce to you Eliane, our speaker today. She's a graduate student at OST. Um, and uh, she's doing this meetup presentation as part of her uh, master's program, which is a very cool feature they have over there. So if you're looking to do a master's, check out OST. Um, <laughs> not sponsored. Uh, <laughs> And the talk today is going to be about functional reactive programming. Um, some of you who like to do functional front-end might have heard of this um, because it's something that used to be used in Elm and other functional front-end frameworks. Um, but I think the talk today is going to be much broader than just front-end. And I think it's a very interesting topic. So um, I'm glad that we have Ilian here today. And you know, give it up to her. So welcome to my talk about functional reactive programming and YAMPA. Um, I'm glad that I can hold my presentation in front of this meetup group. Um, if you have any questions during the talk, uh, during the talk <laughs> um, I'm happy to answer them at the end of the presentation. And I think we start now with a little example that should you give you an idea about functional reactive programming. So this is a flight booking example from the book Functional Reactive Programming. Um, you see here a UI with a, where you can enter a departure and a return date. And there is a button which is only enabled if the departure date is be uh, before the return date. So if you program this in a traditional non-FRP style, it, your code would look something like this. So you have here uh, some code for the UI, for the fields, and for the button. Here you have state variables uh, with the date and the button. Um, here you have an update function where you update if the button is enabled or not. Here you have a listener for the departure date. So if the user changes the date, um, the departure date will be read and stored in the state, and the button is updated. And here's the same for the return date. So what you see here is a lot of code which you use to update your fields and state and everything. And it's only less code about, so, so only, um, this function with the compare is the really dependency between the fields and the button, if the button is enabled. So you could also use a spreadsheet to program this. So you have these two dates where the user can enter a date, our condition. So if the user changes one of the dates, um, the, there will be an automatically update and valid will be updated automatically and directly. And as a programmer, you don't have to do anything about that for, to do that. So FRP proposes an approach that is declarative. So it's not a spreadsheet, of course, but it works in a similar way. So I will now first start with the introduction for, uh, to FRP. And after that, I will show you a project I did last semester where I redesigned the control software of a robotics artwork. So I implemented a simulation of the artwork and used uh, FRP and YAMPA. YAMPA is, by the way, a Haskell implementation of FRP. So the term FRP is used in different ways, and there are different formulations of FRP. But simply said, it's the intersection between reactive programming and functional pr programming. So um, that sounds simple, but it's not that simple because your application, your implementation or your library can also do reactive programming and use functional programming without being FRP. So reactive programming is a specific uh, FRP is a specific method of reactive programming. So the program is event-based and acts in response to its input. Um, FRP enforces the rules of functional programming, in particular the property of compositionality. 
So this allows you to um, build from small with small programs, larger programs. You know this from Haskell. So uh, compositionality applies if you have um, if the composite program only uh, depends on the meaning on of the sub programs and the way they are combined. In FRP, we don't have a state. Uh, in yeah, and in functional programming, we don't have a state. Um, so it's not this um, state machine way of programming. When you're using the state machine style of programming, you have uh, you have to make sure that you um, handle all the events that can occur in all the state that your program can be in. And if you um, don't uh, handle one of this combination, you have to make sure that this never happens. And if it happens, your state is messy and your program is error prone. Um, FRP is not only implemented in Haskell, so there are different libraries, for example, Reactive Coco in Objective-C, Flapjacks in JavaScript, uh, Sodium, which is a FRP library for multiple languages like Java, C Sharp, Scala, and more, and Yampa in Haskell, which we will talk about today. So let's look at the history of Yampa. It starts in 1997, where two important events take pla took place that are relevant for this talk today. So the first is my birth, and the <laughs> second is the publication of functional reactive animation by Elliot and Hudak. So functional reactive animation is the basis of many implementations of FRP. It's a domain-specific language in Haskell, which is used for animations, and it enables you to separate pre the presentation of an animation and the description of what the animation is. Uh, you will see that later in my project. Then they published in 1999 FROB, Functional Robotics. So it's a DSL for use in um, robotic systems. It hides details of the low-level programming, and it's more uh, the code is more hardware independent. So it's a bit like FRAN, but it must deal with additional complexity because an animated figure will always do what you ask, but the robot will not. Then in 2000, Van and Hudak um, published a DSL named FRP, which is the essence of FRAN, and it's more application independent, so it's not only for animations. And then the refinement of this DSL FRP was Yampa in 2002, and it's still used today, and it has been to, uh, used to program mobile robots, games, UI applications, and more. So it, was, it suits good to my task because now I did a simulation, so a UI application, and later maybe I will use, uh, use it to program robotics. To learn more about FRP, uh, let's start with FRAN. There are two important concepts there, behavior and event. Behavior contains um, values that vary over continuous time. So it can be considered as a time that maps type that, ma type that <laughs> maps time to a value. So I try to visualize this. So you have your time and the behavior of integer, which is first zero, then it's one, then it's two. So it varies over the time. Then there are events, which are discrete points in the time span. An event, when an event occurs, it generates a value containing information. So it's, for example, a mouse click, which is the event, and the information can be the position of the mouse. If the event is not interesting, um, we use this empty um, type. Um, events can be thought of as a list with the occurrences, so the time and the value of the event. For example, here we have at 0 0.5 an, ev an event with value one, 
then at time two, an event with value four, and then an event with value three. So if you think about the flight booking example, we have this departure and return date, which are both, or could be both a behavior with a date that changes over time. So during the runtime, a user can't change it, then an event will happen and the value in the behavior will be changed accordingly. Then we have a function which ensures our condition and provides the output behavior of Boolean, um, which is the value, uh, the valid value. So it's true or false. And now if a user changes the date, the valid value will uh, be updated uh, automatically. So every behavior keeps its own value up to date and we don't have to program this update mechanism anymore. So now let's have a look at Yampa. Um, Yampa is, by the way, named after the River Yampa in Colorado. And we have similar concepts. One is called Signal. It's like the behavior in Fran. So it's also continu a continuous time varying value. And then we have Event, which is in, Yampa, uh, in Fran, which only has a value in Fran when an event occurs. You remember the list with the entries. So in Yampa, it's more like a stream, which yields either nothing, like in the maybe type of Haskell, and, or it yields the, um, the value of the event if the event occurs. So it's more like this, nothing, event, nothing, event, nothing, event, nothing. So it's a bit different to friend. The concept of signals enables um, to write pro programs that have time and space leaks. Um, the reason for this is beyond the scope of this talk, but um, Yampa solved the problem by uh, not allowing signals as first class values. So signals can only be accessed in so-called signal functions, and there's no possibility to build signal functions directly. Instead, you have to use a set of combinators that is provided by Yampa. Um, and these combinators ensure that you don't create um, time and space leaks. These um, signal functions are implemented with arrows, which is a generalization of monads proposed by John Hughes. Um, a signal function can be thought of as a mapping of a signal to a signal. So in your code, you will see the type SF um, for the signal function, but you don't see the signals because this is, are, is hidden in, from you. Um, to better understand signal functions, I have um, prepared a small example. Um, we want to imitate a movement and start this movement by a mouse click. So first for the movement, we need a function, uh, which is named constant, which um, provides an output signal that contains the velocity that we are moving, that we are moving with. So this would look like this. Um, so it's just the velocity signal, which always takes the same value. Then to have a movement, we have to integrate this constant value and then we get the position. So it's then like a movement and we do this with integral. So this would be the input signal um, here, um, for example, one or with the value one. And then the integration will look like this and we have a movement with constant velocity. To combine this um, velocity function with the integral, we have to use a combinator because we cannot take the signal the value of the signal out and pass it to another function. So this would look like this. We have this velocity 10 that produces an output uh, signal with a double. And then we integrate it. We can do this with this uh, operator. So in the code, it would look like this. Um, now, if we want to start the movement by a mouse click, we have to 
uh, sig have to use a signal that is first zero and then starts with the velocity. For this, we can use the function hold. So hold holds the start value at the beginning and then this value is replaced when an event occurs with the value that is generated by the event. This looks like this. So we have an event stream as input and the output is a signal. And for example, if the start value is zero, it will be zero at the beginning. Then an event happens with value one. The signal will become one and then two and then one again. Now to combine all these things, um, we can start here with an event. So if we click the mouse, we have an event with an empty type because it's not interesting. And then we have to tag the value of the velocity to it. So with tag, we um, tag, for example, the velocity 10 to the event. So if, it's, if it happens, then hold will hold the first zero, then 10 after the event happened. And the output of hold, we then we can integrate. So you see it's, um, the signal is continuously, it's like a stream which continuously flows through our program and we can um, use the value and change it or uh, manipulate it for our um, application. So here, first, um, nothing comes in, so zero will come out. And then when the event happens with the mouse, um, the event will have the value of 10, for example, and then the integral will make the movement. So what have we saw by now? Um, FRP is a declarative approach to implement reactive applications. So there is no traditional state machine style which can make our code messy. And it's implemented in various languages, for example, in Haskell. So now I told you before, uh, I redesigned the control software of uh, robotic artwork and I used for the simulation of the artwork FRP and Yampa. The artwork is called Pygmies and it's uh, created, it was created by the artist duo Porsche and Rao. Um, they did a talk where they introduced some of their artwork, so um, I will show you this section about Pygmies. The next work is a sound sensitive installation that we affectionately call the Pygmies. And we wanted to work with the notion of being surrounded by a tribe of very shy and sensitive and sweet creatures. So how it works is we have these panels which we have on the wall and behind them we have these little creatures which hide. And as soon as it's silent, they sort of creep out and if it's even more silent, they stretch their necks out and at the slightest sound, they hide back again. So we had these panels on three walls of a room and we had over 500 of these little pygmies hiding behind them. So this is how it works. It's a video uh, prototype. So when it's quiet, it's sort of coming out from behind the panels and they hear like humans do or real creatures do. So they get immune to sounds that scare them after a while and they don't react to background sounds. You'll hear a train in a moment that they don't react to. But they react to foreground sounds. You'll hear that in a second. So we worked very hard to make them as lifelike as possible. So each pygmy has its own behavior cycle, <coughs> mood swings, personalities, and so on. So this is a very early prototype. Of course, it got much better after that. And we made them react to people, but we found that people were being quite playful and childlike with them. So as you can see, it's a pretty great um, artwork. Um, the control software of this artwork is written in a classical, imperative, low-level, low-level imperative style. So the implementation of the behavior of the program is strongly coupled with the control of the actuators. This makes it difficult for non-programmers to adjust the program. Because imagine if you want to change the velocity, um, you, have to, um, you have to give direct commands to the actuators. And if you don't know what you're doing, this can be really error prone. So the idea with FRP was to redesign the control software to make the code more modular 
and to make it easier to understand and maintain. Here you see a simplified version of the core of the control software. It's the program for one pygmy. Um, you can see it's a, this state machine style. So you have the states and if program is in a state then this, uh, the, accord, the according uh, code will, the corresponding code will be executed. So first the pygmy is in the hide state and then the actuators move to the hiding position and then a waiting time is set and the new state is set to go peaking. So there happens nothing until the time is up and then the pygmy moves out. So it peaks over the edge. After that, uh, the next state is set, which is go standing and then the pygmy goes fully out and then it waits where nothing happens. So what you can see is it's clear what happens in each state. But what you don't see is where and when the state is set. So for example, these are clear. So uh, go peaking is set in the state before in, or in the switch case statement before. But hide is set outside of this program. So you can set everywhere where you can have everywhere where you have access to the state variable, you can set the state. So if you want to um, introduce a new step, you have to search all the occurrences of state transitions and have to make sure that you understand where what happens. And this is um, really error prone. So let's have a look about, uh, let's have a look at the new design. So here in the middle, you have this pygmy signal function, which is started for each pygmy, and it's producing a position signal. And it um, adapts this signal to the current program. So the UI library only is, only is drawing pygmies, and it's not doing some animation in the way that you will do it in an imperative style. So let's have a closer look. Um, the input is a keyboard because it, or it, <laughs> the input is the keyboard which imitates the sound input of a microphone. So with the keys one to nine, I can uh, adapt the, the sound signal. So it holds the last value that was pressed. This sound signal is then the input for all the pygmy functions that are started for each pygmy. This uh, pygmy function, uh, for example, moves, uh, makes a, the position increasing. So it pygmy is moving out when the sound signal is in the quiet interval. When it's in the interval four to six, there is a small sound. So some of the pygmies will hide completely and some will go to peak, to peaking state. So the pygmy is moving back and the position is decreased. When a loud sound happens, um, all pygmies hide and all pygmies will go to hiding position and wait there. So the position will stay zero. The UI library displays then all the pygmies on different sides on the panel and interpret this, this position signal. So on the top level, for example, the, there's a pygmy which has a fixed coordinate X and Y will be changing according to the position. So if, so the UI is drawing the pygmy again and again if the position is changing. So it will draw it at position x, y when the uh, current position is zero and it will draw it again and again if it's moving out on the corresponding coordinate. In the imperative style, you would uh, tell the UI to, to make an animation or a movement. So you would tell the, where the pygmy has to move but here the UI only draws the pygmy at the position that you tell him to, or it to, to draw the pygmy. So now this is separated and the UI only has to draw. Um, we can do this in Yampa with the reactimate function, which is the main loop of your program. Um, first it starts initialization action 
and in my case, it initialized the UI and the keyboard input. After that, the simulation starts, and the input sensing, sensing action function returns new keyboard input and stores it in a controller state. So you have here these Boolean values, and if a key is pressed, it becomes true, and if it's released, it becomes false again. Then in the play pick me function, I can uh, create the sound sig signal from this state. So if there is a change, an event will happen and the sound signal will hold the last key pressed. And then all the pick me signal functions are run and the position are gathered together and then passed to the output processing action which passes it to the UI library. So this is how it comes all together. Now, let's have a look at this pygmy function. So, as I told you before, the pygmy function um, takes the sound as input and produces the position as output. So here, First, it takes a position, the current position of the pygmy and the sound as input for a program function. This function defines the velocity if the pygmy is moving out or back or uh, stays at one position. Then we can integrate this function, uh, this value according to our example before, and then we get the position. And this position is then again, is on. Uh, is the output of the function and it's also the input for program. So we have a loop here which is possible in Yampa. Then um, this program function should react to danger. So we have uh, the safe behavior function which uh, produces the velocity uh, when the pygmy is moving out. And then we have a danger event source which produces an event when the sound signal is in a loud in, uh, interval. Um, we can do this with the function switch. Switch will switch between two signal function when an event occurs. So we have here safe behavior and danger combined. Um, so safe behavior moving out velocity and then enter the event source where the event comes when um, occurs when the sound is too loud. In this case, it will switch and the new signal function is go hiding, which produces a negative velocity, so the pygmy is moving back. After that, it will go, so this is go hiding and this is a negative velocity and the pygmy is moving until it arrives. So then an arrival event occurs and the program will switch again and recalls uh, program again so we can start new with the safe behavior where the pygmy is moving out. <coughs> Let's have a closer look to this. Um, so first the pygmy waits until it is safe again and the sound is in a quiet interval. Then it will switch and the pygmy waits until its individual time is up. So not all the pygmies are coming out at the same time. After that, the pygmy goes to the, with the peaking velocity out until it arrives at the peaking position. Then it waits again until his waiting time is up then it goes to the standing position until it arrives, and then it waits there. Let's have a closer look to this moving and waiting. So first go peaking is a constant velocity, and arrival has a condition that an event should occur when the pygmy is passing the pygmy position, uh, the peaking position. So the function edge produces an event when the condition turns from false to true. So combined, it looks like this. We have go peaking, which produces the velocity, and we have arrival, which produces an event, which will trigger the switch. 
and then they are combined together as input for the switch function. Weighting works uh, similar, so weight is a constant velocity of zero, and the event is here time, named time is up, so there I can specify a time where an event should occur, and then it will be combined together as input for the next switch statement. So here you see the old design again. Um, this sw uh, state machine switch statement, and um, you see we have here this, uh, we don't see where the state transition happens, and we see um, that we communicating directly with the uh, actuators. And in the new design, it is clear when which event happens, and or not when the event happens, but which reaction will be um, executed after an event happens. So if we want to introduce here a new step, we know what happens before and after and where, why the event is changing the program. The Pygmy's artwork is characterized by the fact that the figures look lifelike and this is because all the creatures move slightly differently from each other, creating a lifelike feel like uh, that of squirrels or mice. Uh, this is because each pygmy has its own parameters, how it is moving and how long it's waiting. And, and a behavior algorithm specifies, um, depending on the sound level, how fast the pygmies are moving and how long they are waiting. So if it's louder, they are more nervously, so they are uh, stay hidden longer and they move faster. I tried to implement this, but time was short, so I simplified the algorithm. So it, the pygmies do not look as lifelike as in the original. I have here a video of the current uh, UI. You see uh, here the terminal output, where you can see when I press a button, because the key will change. So now I triggered one, so it's quiet and the pygmy will move out. Now I pressed six, so it's a small um, noise and the, not all pygmies are hiding. And now nine is loud, so all pygmies hiding, are hiding. So now I try to uh, simulate a noisy room, so I switch between six and nine again and again. And then you will see that the pygmies are, are hidden longer and move a bit faster. So they are more nervously and more shy. But yeah, they are not as lifelike as in the original because time was short. Um, so FRP is not a panacea. I um, noticed that during the implementation. I told you before that this state, transition, uh, this state machine style is really error prone, but um, it's also possible in FRP to uh, make strange, uh, strange application. So um, I had, um, during I, implemented the different behavior of the pygmies. Suddenly not all pygmies are coming, were coming out anymore and they are, were missing. And it was really strange and it took me long to find the error. And at the end it was because I didn't handle the events properly. So I had this is safe again function which produces an event when the sound signal enters the quiet interval. So if a danger event occurs, the pygmies are hiding, and then it's called pro it calls program again, and safe behavior 
has this weight as first step where the pygmy's wait to go out until this is safe again triggers uh, or generates an event. So the problem is now when the pygmies are hiding and then the sound level um, comes into this quiet interval, is safe again will produce the event, but the pygmy will miss it because they are still hiding. And when they are uh, waiting, then there is no event in is safe again until the next time it's loud again. Um, so you still have to program your events properly. But um, the implementation with FRP was very promise, is very promising. So the code is more modular and the state transition are more visible. So it's easier to understand the code. And I think it's simpler to make changes. Um, but you have to program your events properly. The one drawback, wa drawback was the um, arrow concept because it's hard to understand for beginners. Maybe you remember when you learned monads the first time, it's not that easy and also not for a non-programmer. So in a further development, I should offer an abstraction um, which allows someone to adjust the behavior of the pygmies without using arrows. The implementation comes close to the artwork. Uh, but the pygmies are not as lifelike as in the original, but uh, I can implement that with FRP. I just need more time for that. So the next step would be to replace the control software and um, with the control to the actuators. And um, because the UI component is separated, this should be um, makeable without changing the code much but I have to implement an error handling because the hardware is much more complex than an animation. So I hope I could give you a good first impression uh, about FRP. And at this point, many thanks for having me here today. And I think we will have now some time for questions or discussion. So this uh, combinator, um, so for the switch, um, which was before. So for this switch, we always have uh, the current signal function and the new signal function. And the current signal function must be combined with the event stream that should trigger the switch. And for this, I can use this uh, ampersand um, operator and this combines then the velocity and the event together to this uh, tuple. Okay. So I tried to reduce the code a bit, so I took out this um, this uh, slide. So this is the type of switch, and um, the input is the signal function. A B is uh, so B is the current behavior or current signal, and then event C is the uh, event triggering the switch, and then we have here the new behavior. And at the end, if we combine all this together, we get a signal function from A to B. So A is the input. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. 
I don't know. I don't know the Elm implementation that good to, to make a, to compare it with Yampa. Um, I think they have, their implementation ensures that you don't miss the first event or you can, um, so this is a, a problem that you have in imperative programming sometimes. Um, and you can, I think you can decide if you want to miss the first event probably or not. Um, and they, um, if the event occurs, it will not miss it, but it can be that it will handle it later. So not exact in time because then it's not, um, so it has like a, a stack with events and not, it, it's not um, handle it in, in this second, but maybe in the next second. So, but I don't know Elm uh, enough to, to compare it. Um, so the event is not ignored. Um, I didn't handle the event because I only handle the event when the pygmy is in this signal function. So it's not that the event is missing, but um, the event happens before the pygmy is waiting for the event. And um, I I could uh, fix this. I, I, co I, I could fix it um, by doing a repeatedly event. So um, if the pygmy, if the, the sound is in the quiet integral, there will be repeatedly um, generated, <laughs> there will be repeatedly events during this time and when the sound signal leaves the integral there will at the interval there will be no events anymore so this is possible so it, it was really my fault that it didn't happen it's not a yampa fault so the event is not missing because it's not there um, I miss it because I'm not at it happens before I wait for it Yeah. And so um, I guess I was wondering whether maybe changing the way the events are included <coughs> would make them sort of would force you <coughs> to handle every event in every state. So at least like provide an implicit <coughs> but I don't know how the event type works, so I'm not sure whether you can encode it that way so you can force the compiler to make sure you handle every event. I think if I want to um, a reaction to an event all the time when it happens, I have to do it um, outside of the function. So the da if the danger event occurs, then it will always be hiding because it's in the... Um, yeah. So here, if, uh, if an um, event is in safe behavior, it will not react because it's not the reaction to this event. And if I want to uh, stop safe behavior, if the event happens or handle the event in safe behavior, I have to do it one layer outside. So in the program function, like the danger event. Yes. Um, there is, you can define, uh, yeah, something like this. It, I did this in a other function. I'm not sure. Yeah. I don't think you can t say like t 10 milliseconds, but you can do it faster or less faster, but I think there is a limit somewhere. So, but you can speed it up. Uh, it should because they programmed robot with robotics with it. 
Um, yeah, I don't know. But I think one of the drawbacks is that's not as good in real time as uh, imperative. But I have to try it out when I do the robotics. Yes. So, oh. <laughs> so I mean, did you, I see, I see you're not using error notation. Did you try it and feel like it wasn't that as clear? I used error notation, but I kicked it out of the presentation. <laughs> so all this, um, I can show you. For example, the pygmy function is in error notation, but I thought it would be easier to explain it fast if I uh, do this diagram. So the error notation looks like this. Um, it's it's a, another way to um, to code because uh, sometimes this linking of all these combinators are getting really complicated. And then you can use this error syntax as an alternative monad syntax for the maybe uh, for the for monads alternate. So it's like the do notation in monads. And um, you see the input signal is sound and the output is position. And then you can take the value out of the signal with sound. Uh, here it's sound. And then you have this do notation. And then here you see the arrows. So sound and position is the input of program the signal function, so it will be um, wrapped in a signal again, and then extracted from the output signal, the V, which is the velocity. And um, at the end, you return a signal again. And the rec keyword is because we have this recursion. Yes? So one point was that it is still maintained. Um, so not all, of course, not all FRP's libraries are not maintained, but Yampa is now maintained. And uh, it was used for robotics and UI applications, so it fits uh, to my uh, task. And for my project, I started with Fran, um, with the original implementation of FRP by Connell Elliott. And then I followed this path. So I used Jampa because I thought it's really near to the original concept in Fran. But of, of course, it's a bit, little bit different. And of course, there are other libraries. And um, some of them are not um, implementing real FRP. So you can find some. Um, Stack Overflow comments from Connell Elliott where he says why it's not FRP. <laughs> um, yeah, I took it uh, because of that, but um, there are of course other libraries that would also fit the task. I know it was uh, out of scope what these are and <laughs> how Yampa prevents it is with the signals. The space leak happens with signals. So if we have a signal that returns itself, so we have the output is a signal of a signal. So we have so you cannot program it like this because signals are uh, in the signal function in Yampa, but signal to like signal A, uh, signal of signal A. And now the signal is returning itself. So when the first value the first value on the signal, or, or if you have a time span, um, 
and we have the so it's it's a continuous value but just to to imagine so we have value one then the output would be value one at this time at the time two so of, as I said it's a continuous uh, signal but we have again value or value two is better and now if the signal is returning itself as a signal of a signal it will return at uh, time two one and two so all the values of it and then it goes on And on, and you see that you have uh, n, n at time n you have n square, yeah, n square values that you have to store because you have the signal of the signal, and you have always to return the whole signal from beginning. So it will be getting bigger, and then you run into a memory leak. So this would be one example. As I understand. Yes. Is something like that possible? So that the person exchange messages between each other or send each other links or I'm not sure, but I think so because um, here in in the function play pygmies, I start each of this pygmy function. So I think maybe there I could do something like this, but I'm not sure. But I start all the functions, so not Yampa is starting all of them. And I um, pass the um, sound signal as input, and um, I create the sound signal. So that's all happening there. So I think maybe there will be a communication will be possible. Sorry. Yes. I have a bit more, a bit of experience with uh, uh, FRP as well. It is possible to have an output, or rather a sync for your behavior, that also emits the delay. So in this case, as you said, when you create the signals, they can actually, instead of returning units, they can return an event of a decision, let's say. And mm -hmm. then it's your responsibility to collect all of these decision events out. Right here, play figures, it would be something like, pick me decisions, left arrow, play figures. And then you would have to kind of have a feedback loop. It is possible. But you have to wire it up at their parents, right? Thanks. <laughs> cool. And if there's no further questions, thanks again for really on. And, uh, Thank you very much. <laughs>Uh, hello, internet people. So, as I said, uh, today I got the good news that I'll be working on DOSH, which is the uh, next generation rich interac interactive Haskell repo. Before we dive in, a quick survey. Who here enjoys using their terminal to interact with their computer? Show of hands. Very good. This project is for you, because you're also Haskellers. Uh, so, what's the motivation behind DOSH? I think the best way to motivate this is via meme. So, um, does anyone have any Python user friends that they ever talked about? Haskell with. Um, talking to Python people about Haskell is super nice because you can always just say, your language is a joke, and then they say your tooling is a joke. Uh, and indeed, if you've ever tried using uh, GHCI from the terminal, it's absolutely awful. Entering multiple lines of code is, um, you know, that's what the kids are doing these days. There's no syntax highlighting, there's no error reporting, nothing. Um, and yet, if you want to do some um, data science, quote unquote, generating some numbers and uh, printing them, that's uh, the best we've got. And of course, um, you know, here's the guy she told you not to worry about. So uh, what do we have here? That's uh, on the left side we have uh, Python notebooks and on the right side we have Mathematica, which is a um, nice, both of them are GUI uh, programs. And what they do is they let you run code and evaluate them uh, and evaluate the code and uh, have some nice visualizations. Uh, to be honest, I would be happy with just like textual output um, in real time. So the problem has been set. What can we do about it? So today's talk was about um, FRP. Uh, FRP, as we learned, is not just about GUIs, it's also good for TUIs, so um, text uh, user interfaces, which can happen in the uh, CLI. Um, so for example, imagine we have a 
like a prompt, right? Well, what, is, what is a shell? What is a, a REPL? It's a, it reads your command. You press enter, it evaluates your command. Simple as that. Uh, but we can have um, really groundbreaking things like syntax highlighting, right? Um, for example. Uh, what else can we have? We can um, notice that there's an error, and we can um, tell the user in a little pop-up, ooh, 2010s, um, pop-up in the terminal. Uh, and the way this is done is in FRP, you can, um, sorry, with N curses, if you're familiar with uh, VTY uh, terminology, you can have, you can draw anywhere on the screen. So for example, here, we could show this error when the user hovers over this uh, function, right? Um, and uh, what else can we have? Multi-line input. So imagine you press shift and enter, like you don't finish your command, you don't want to run it, you press shift and enter to enter multiple lines, for example. Oh, right, disclaimer, this does not exist yet. This is all made in Google Slides. There's no Haskell program that does this yet because I haven't started working on it yet. But it's just an idea, it's a pitch. Um, so we can enter all of this code. Um, ah, yes, uh, another nice thing we can do, right? Uh, with the Haskell language server, with any LSP really, we can ask it what is the type of is prime. We didn't type any um, type annotations here because those are too pedestrian, but we can have the language server tell us what the type is. And, um, you know, wouldn't that be neat? Ah, so another, another concept of a notebook style workflow is these cells. You see cell number one, cell number two. The idea is that you can edit them separately. So uh, you're done with your fancy prime number generation function. Um, you enter the second block and you say, give me 10 primes. And then you wait forever because uh, this is not a correct implementation of primes. Aha. Um, so let's cancel it. So how would we fix this uh, prime number function? The problem is uh, it's a recursive definition um, in in prime factors, we're referring to primes, but primes doesn't know how to compute even the first element yet. So one thing we can do is we can just add that too. But imagine doing this in a shell, right? I mean, you don't really get to change the history. You have to kind of repeat the, um, you have to repeat all the lines. And this is what you do in GHCI as well. Um, you know, the old shameful lines are still there, but then you re-add them painstakingly one by one. In a notebook, in a notebook uh, workflow, you just press arrow up three times, I guess. Uh, you put two colon there, you press enter to reevaluate it, and you see the number change to three, because um, I edited the text in Google Slides. But then you press the arrow down to go to the bottom, uh, to go to the bottom um, cell to reevaluate it. Now it uh, now it changed to four, and you get your fancy primes. Uh, you know, Python users have been laughing behind our backs since you know the 1990s. But um, we can do so much more with this. You know, this is the terminal. We have FRP. We can show plots. Um, don't take this seriously. This is like literally a screenshot from Wolf of Alpha, but it is possible to draw plots in the terminal. Um, in fact, it's possible to have a browser in the terminal. There's a fancy new one. Uh, and I don't mean like links. I mean legitimately converting images to rust, like to little pixelated images and such. It's really crazy what you can do in um, terminals these days. But wouldn't it be neat to visualize your data like that? Um, ah, I see. I did the animations wrong. That's all I have for you. So that's the, that's the pitch. The pitch is a fancy uh, Haskell shell, REPL, whatever. Uh, if you're interested, uh, buy me a beer. Uh, there's also a, it's also uh, on GitHub, so thank you. <laughs>